welcome to Think In, the podcast series, the Kautilya School of Public Policy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Think In, the podcast club of Kautilya School of Public Policy. When we think of public policy, we tend to think about government, bureaucracy, specialists who come together to formulate plans to achieve certain objectives. But this is all policy. Time and again, we have seen that policies fail their intended objectives or create newer problems while implementation of that policy happens. How can we aim to circumvent these problems? How can we keep public at the center of public policy to mitigate problems arising from strategies intended for the masses? To answer these questions and more, we have a very special guest with us today, Mr. Arvind Lodaya. Mr. Arvind is a design thinking and innovation guru. He is a pioneer of product design, strategic branding, product and UI UX design, transcultural design, to name a few. He has a massive volume of work that he has done over the years. But what intrigues me is his interest in social enterprises and cultural policy. He is here to talk about design thinking and public policy. Welcome to Think In, Mr. Lodaya. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you, Kautilya School of Public Policy. My first question to you is, how is design thinking related to public policy? That was a question that occurred to me when uh, I was asked by your school to consider taking a course on design thinking uh, in your program. And uh, in, in one sense, the answer was quite clear to me because uh, that is an area that I've been dying to uh, get involved with and participate in or contribute to in whatever way that I can. Um, and that is because I've seen time and again, as you mentioned in your, in your introduction, the, you know, the failure of public policy at when it reaches the public level. I mean, it may be a brilliant policy at the planning level, uh, but at, when it reach, finally reaches the delivery point, point of delivery, that's really where so many failures occur. And that's really what design specializes in. Uh, it's looking at the entire consumer experience or user experience as the heart of its concern. Uh, and then it moves outward from there in terms of making everything else possible that enables uh, this kind of a very positive and satisfying consumer experience. So the meeting point of these two, the kind of top-down perspective of public policy uh, and the bottom-up perspective of design thinking, I think is a meeting that's long overdue. Interesting. Uh, you say that uh, we need to treat uh, the beneficiaries as customers, right? And design the service around the customers. Uh, very interesting. Uh, but uh, we often hear people say that uh, you cannot satisfy everyone, right? right. And uh, it is safe to say that uh, no matter how vivid the policy is, it might cause injustice of some sort to a subsection of society. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a valid point. And in fact, I would also qualify the first part that you mentioned that I don't think one can literally equate citizens uh, and government the relationship as equivalent to consumers and uh, business. It's not the same. But I think there are many points that are that overlap. And certainly there are many inspirations, many positive kind of learnings that can be applied across the categories. Um, so I would say that there is a lot that government service design and delivery systems uh, can learn from successful or good examples of product or service delivery from the business side. Uh, having said that, the second part of the question, I think the, the answer still lies in the way business also uh, uh, tries to satisfy its entire market uh, target market. And if you look at it uh, as, if you look at the kind of strategies that they use, which is segmentation, product differentiation, um, and also customizability uh, and personalization of, of the product or service, these are all strategies that are extremely applicable uh, in principle to, to public services as well. So I think uh, while it is a fact that, uh, uh, you know, no one service or whatever can satisfy everybody, but perhaps there are many things one can do, for example, not to have a, a really one size fits all policy. I mean, that was that was abandoned by business ages ago. They realized that it was actually not serving their purpose whatsoever. Uh, and in fact, it was counterproductive for them. And as you said, because a lot of unintended negative impact also took place because of this one size fits all approach to serving a fairly large 
market segment, even though by government standards, it may not be very large. It's not like the nation, but it's definitely a market segment, which is a part, part of the national consumption consumer profile. Um, so I think the way that business has looked at, um, you know, serving different, firstly, identifying different segments with their different needs and context, and then designing specific services uh, or products or a combination of the two for each of them uh, in a very, very effective manner and doing so in a culture of continuous innovation, which means that, uh, you know, you don't just give it once and then say, now my job is done, uh, but you keep getting feedback. And that's one of the benefits of uh, competition is that you're always in a competitive context, which means that you're being forced to, to, you know, even if you're good and competent and you have uh, dominance in the marketplace, you can't take it for granted. You can't assume that, uh, you know, next year is going to be the same again. Uh, so you're always on your toes. You're always trying to improve your quality and improve your performance criteria, uh, improve your reach, outreach, and so on and so forth. So I think those principles are eminently uh, transferable to the public policy uh, design and implementation uh, space. Okay. So uh, well, that, that was really very insightful. So what I drew from it uh, is that the state or the government cannot act as a, a monolithic uh, dictator. Monopoly, monopoly. And, and yeah, and it, it, it has to act as an equal stakeholder in the whole process. And uh, you, uh, while talking, I, uh, I sense that you, you are giving much more weight to the process rather than the outcome. So uh, is that the principle of design thinking, uh, giving weight to process uh, of actually, the formulation? It's actually equal weight to both. Usually one has seen that either one uh, puts too much, uh, I mean, people privilege or put too much emphasis on one of the two, either it's product centric or it's process centric. I think the, the unique thing about design thinking, at least from my knowledge or understanding of the other kind of disciplines and fields is that it is an equal mix of both. And of course, uh, the, the cliche or the standard uh, you know, the blurb that we go by is that it is human centric, that eventually it is, you know, we as humans who are at the center of the entire planning, execution, design process, and we are neither process nor product exclusive as human beings. We, we need some kind of fulfillment uh, from the products or services that we buy or that we utilize. And that is, uh, it, we don't really care how it comes to us, whether it's in the form of a product or a service or something else. Um, as long as our needs are met, as long as our uh, complaints or grievances are heard, uh, as long as we feel that we are being served, I think that's that's the convergence that design thinking looks at, is that how do we completely or as close as, as much as possible satisfy or fulfill the consumer, or in this case, the citizen. Satisfaction of the citizen. Wow. So uh, that that uh, brings me to the next question. So um, while while you were here and uh, uh, you talk about uh, empathy led design, yes. so uh, there there are even though the principles are uh, uh, you know loosely knit and um, uh, there there are uh, basic uh, frameworks uh, you can apply uh, to go about formulating a policy. Now, one of those frameworks is uh, prototyping. Yeah. So uh, in a country like India, uh, do you think it is a major challenge? Uh, let's say some, some uh, lawmaker or policy makers uh, are uh, intending to go about changing the education landscape of uh, the country. And they prototype an idea uh, and uh, test it out in a, in a uh, public school in some part of Haryana probably. So will that give them adequate or accurate results when they try to replicate that in some part of Odisha or Kerala? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Need not. Uh, and this is something that as we discussed earlier, that one size fits all or one policy is applicable everywhere uh, is a very deeply flawed idea. Uh, and and uh, it cannot, it, I mean, by, by any yardstick, it cannot aspire to satisfy everybody because the conditions, contexts, uh, aspirations, and needs and uh, are, are all very, very different for even forget remote, I mean, different states, but even within the same state or even within the same city, there are different constituencies who, whose outlook, whose situation is completely different. So their expectations of what would satisfy them or empower them would be very different from each other. So I think the answer is uh, to find a way to, to de-monolithize the space of policy making and policy, uh, you know, 
an executive and administration, which basically means that policy needs to have perhaps a very strong core uh, set of values and principles or premises at the defining level, but the way it gets translated into, into, into implementation and to delivery uh, needs to be completely customized and adapted to the local context and to the local constituency. So the it's like the Constitution of India. You know, it's a large, it's a huge guiding document which gives macro level principles, values from which we can then infer, interpret, and apply in the context that we are in. Uh, and I think that's the kind of uh, relationship that could be, you know, advanced as we go forward. That allows the policy to retain a common vision or agenda because it does need to have that kind of a point of view. A policy cannot be multi. Uh, directional or multi uh, polar in some sense it has to have some kind of a tangent or a perspective but the way it applies and the way it manifests and the way it makes itself accessible to different people could be different so when you say let's say quality education what is quality education to somebody who's a you know rural laborer uh, that may be very different from what is quality education to uh, let's say a educated middle class family in a urban uh, metropolis um, and both may have the aspiration for quality, but the way in which they expect it, the way they, in which they need it, that it is valuable and meaningful to them would be very, very different. So you wouldn't have the same uh, piece or the same, uh, uh, you know, the solution in its final form, in its delivery form, applicable everywhere. But you can still talk, the policy can still talk about quality, because that is an important and consistent benchmark across the board. Everybody wants quality. Everybody likes uh, is aspiring to some kind of quality. So I think that's the kind of negotiation that needs to be done. Is the higher value should be enshrined at the policy level, uh, and it should be left perhaps or should be developed in collaboration with the local authorities at the grassroots level to interpret it and roll it out in at the local context. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, you mentioned about quality. So uh, one one of uh, so I want to address two constraints like uh, as an aspiring policymaker or someone who is just starting out in the policy space, I believe that there are two constraints which I am not able to figure out how design thinking would go about it. One of it is the constraint of time. So I believe that design thinking in its entirety can be a very tedious activity to go about it, uh, and uh, we we've, our aim is not to compromise on quality. But uh, does it hamper the efficiency of uh, the policy making and implementation itself? I don't know the what to compare it with in the sense that I don't know what the current time frame of policy development and design uh, is. I'm guessing that even that's not a short, uh, quick kind of a process. It involves uh, building on a lot of uh, prior existing research uh, and you know doing surveys of all kinds, a lot of uh, data gathering a lot of data verification as well, because there's all kinds of inconsistencies and, and gaps in data sets and so on and so forth. Um, and then the whole process of consulting, consulting all the stakeholders, taking their views on board before a draft is created, then the draft is circulated to the stakeholders uh, and so on. So I'm imagining that even the current policy process is by no means quick. And I think that's a good thing because, I mean, before rolling out a policy or making it official, you need to have really thoroughly uh, you know, checked it out and made sure that it is going to achieve the kind of result or impact that, that the, the policymakers hope to have with it. In that context, I think design thinking is no uh, additional extra time uh, involved. It is, it, it is not a substitute to the current process. It is an adjunct to the current process. So I would say in some ways, it is actually an accelerator to the current process as well. Because in the whole rapid prototyping part of design thinking, uh, as you saw in the short videos that we did and all of that, uh, we reached, we did a kind of very, uh, we don't wait to get the full picture completely clear before we start coming out with ideas and thoughts about solutions. And we don't wait for the solution to be perfectly created on paper, you know, I, exactly detailed and blueprinted and all of that before we take, move it into the prototype or pilot form. Uh, you start converting ideas very quickly into very rough and crude uh, ideas which can be tested uh, and which which you can get feedback from from all the different constituencies that you're addressing it to. So my own thought is that actually design thinking can be a, a fairly a substantial booster 
both in terms of the capability enhancement of the current process, which I feel by contrast is too uh, academic in some sense. It is very much about uh, paper-based kind of thinking and you know policies and you refer to experts who are academics who have published a lot of papers or written books about it, not to demean, de devalue what they've done, but there is no engagement or uh, you know, active consultation of the beneficiaries in the process. Here, you're actually testing them, testing out the concepts or ideas as they emerge in a collaborative space with the uh, beneficiary public or at least representatives uh, who give you live real feedback. And if you, and some of the, the examples we looked at even in the course are these so-called innovation labs that are being set up in many countries. So that's really their function. Their function is to catalyze the, the current policy making process with this kind of an active hands-on approach uh, and a very, very, uh, uh, you know, as close to reality as possible approach. So the policy is not being developed in ivory towers or in you know parliament or in those kind of think tanks, fishy bhavans or whatever it might be, but it's being developed as close to the ground as possible in, in a way that the stakeholders or beneficiaries at the grassroots level can participate in it and can also respond to it as it is being drafted. So you can course correct even while the process is on. So net-net, I think, Design thinking is actually a great plugin. It can be added into the current uh, policy formulation process, and it can really um, make up for a lot of the gaps that, that I think are currently there. All right. Uh, amazing. You talked about formulating policy as close uh, to the ground. Uh, now that uh, brings me to the next constraint I want to address. Uh, so one, one of the major constraints, especially in Indian con, uh, context, is uh, the political economy. So depending on the region and ambit of any policy, it is quite possible that the political economy is ob oblivious to the empathy-led uh, design thinking approach and they focus on garnering votes more. So uh, let's say a problem between two states on water sharing. So that is a policy problem. Now, how can I, as an aspiring policymaker, uh, you know, aim to use tools of design thinking to, uh, you know, mitigate that problem or go about that problem? Right. So, uh, a policy on water sharing, for example, is uh, relatively less, uh, you know, in a in a uh, experiential way, uh, it's less uh, tangible to an, an average citizen as compared with, let's say, health or education, which really affects one's everyday life. Of course, you can argue that the availability of water can make a huge difference, and it does. There's no question about it. But that's really a, a decision or a, or a call in terms of just the access to resource. Um, and it's not really a technical or a challenge or, or a socio-cultural challenge. It's actually more of, like you said, a, a perhaps a judicial kind of challenge in terms of what is appropriate for whom and so on and so forth. So, but even there, I feel the methodology of design thinking, which is to bring together multiple stakeholders and multiple disciplinary lenses to, to look at, examine a particular naughty issue or a wicked problem uh, and try and um, think it through together uh, in a kind of constrained manner can, and, and of course the emphasis like we talked about on out of the box ideas. So apart from evaluating the, the conventional kind of ideas, which are the most reasonable, logical, rational ones. Uh, if there is also a space to, in addition, to add out of the box thinking and ideas, uh, that gives you more options to actually look at. And one of the, the, both the flaws and strengths of the design thinking approach is its constant search for win-win ideas, is to try and avoid a win-lose scenario as far as possible. Now, many people, including me, have been critical of it because especially when you're dealing with, with power, and with distribution of resources and stuff like that, you can't really have a win-win solution in every case. Uh, so you have to somewhere draw the line and say, no, this is where some, some kind of uh, constituency has to win at the expense of the other constituency, but done so in a fair and considered and thought through kind of a manner, ideally a consultative manner as well. Um, so though that notwithstanding, design thinking is very prolific and very uh, productive in the space of generating win-win ideas or approaches, which are usually not, we do not occur to people in the planning space or in the, uh, you know, product development space either. Most people just take what is existing and what they know of as the uh, discourse, as the limit of the discourse, and think that that is the only space in which solutions can be ever found. 
Um, and it takes somebody to come out with a fairly radical perspective to change that and to actually challenge it with completely new or innovative ideas. That that sounds too good to be true. But uh, like uh, you, you mentioned about uh, the win-win or win-lose uh, conundrum in design thinking. And uh, uh, so what I wanted to ask you is that uh, like, you, you, you are one of the stalwarts in the industry, right? Uh, in, in terms of design thinking. So can we expect people like you to approach uh, political parties and do design thinking in their manifestos? Because essentially everything stems uh, from the manifestos that uh, the people, uh, you know, they, they are served. Uh, the political parties um, come up with manifestos. They use it as their, uh, you know, uh, USPs. And then they garner votes. Yeah, I think um, it's a very interesting question that you asked me. And it's something that I have definitely been thinking about for a long time. But there are two factors. One is that uh, the culture of design practice and even design education is very apolitical or almost one might say anti-political. It's like when I went to college and studied design and all of that, the idea of politics was like an untouchable kind of thing. That That's something, you know, and it's far away, far removed from the world of beauty and elegance and innovation, et cetera, et cetera, that we were looking forward. So, so we were oriented almost exclusively to look into the domain of business and industry as our karma bhumi, as the place where we would, we would you know, manifest our, our destiny. For me, it was a, a challenge and a, an exciting learning experience to break out of that and get involved with the social sector. Uh, so when I started working with uh, community organizations and NGOs. That was a mind-blowing opportunity for me to learn and to find my place in that space as well. Uh, I would think that the space of, of politics and governance is, is certainly uh, uh, a place where designers and design thinkers can play a, a key role. In fact, uh, one might say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, already we do know that people from advertising and marketing uh, and PR and so on are already becoming very, very influential in the world of, of, of politics. And there's no reason why, why designers who are in a sense siblings to the same set of people uh, should not be part of that as well. I have to say one more thing, which is that I think we have a fairly cliched notion, including we designers ourselves, not just uh, everybody else, about who designers are and what they do. So when you say design, I would normally think of a fashion designer or of a textile designer or of some uh, set designer or whatever it is, right? So we only think on those terms. We never think of politicians as designers. We never think of bureaucrats as designers. Uh, we never think of you know, institution builders as designers. But I think we, we have to completely redefine the definition of what design is and open it up to include anybody and everybody who uses the same principles that we talk about in design, like empathy, innovation, creativity, rapid kind of iterative development, uh, and so on, and systemic kind of perspective, uh, who, who's doing that without being trained or without even using the design jargon. And I think that that is a huge uh, step towards integrating design with the larger discourse of, of nation building of policy and so on. Uh, I definitely believe that the current regime, the Modi regime, has, has uh, enormously benefited from, from design. Although you may not see a designer like me out there, or you may not call uh, Mr. Modi or Mr. Shah or any of their team members as designers, but they are designers. They are using so many principles that designers use, and they're using them pretty effectively, and as we know, to good effect. Um, so I think that the it's already happening, except that you know the so-called designers are not yet there, and the so-called definition of design has not yet uh, you know, sort of caught up with the reality. In reality, I think it's already happening as, as we speak. Right. Uh, as you mentioned that the current regime is, uh, you know, benefiting from designers. I hope that it turns to empathy-led design soon. But uh, so uh, while I was uh, introducing you, uh, I mentioned that uh, it intrigues me that you were interested in social enterprises. So uh, for our audiences, can you share some stories uh, 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 of uh, your uh, mentees or uh, some enterprises that you're involved with? Yeah, I mean, that's been something I've been doing for the last two decades nearly now. So it's, it's a field, again, very, it came out of my involvement and engagement with the social sector when I was still a young kind of designer finding my way in the world. But it was so, so powerful and inspiring for me 
that I knew that, you know, that was an area that I would definitely remain involved with for the rest of my life. And at some point I began, I reached a kind of uh, status, so to speak, where people began approaching me or, you know, sort of asking for my inputs in terms of uh, helping them flesh out their own social enterprise ideas. And also the startup economy was slowly going past its first dot-com kind of, uh, uh, you know, phase and looking for other areas in which they can create value, a uh, combination of uh, business kind of uh, outcomes, but also social or environmental and other kind of outcomes. So that's that's a good trend, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it in whatever way I can. Uh, there's one, for example, enterprise that I was part of. I must say that uh, that's the, the, the in advance that many of these ventures that I've been associated with have collapsed, have shut down. And, and that's quite typical for the startup sector. I mean, it's not specific to these enterprises. It's part of the average and there are many, many factors that cause it, uh, some of which definitely have to do with design or the lack of design thinking in some. In some. But just to give you an example, there is one uh, in, uh, startup that I was involved with, which, which whose aim was to provide a really high quality um, technical education or coding education to people from uh, sort of peri-urban or rural backgrounds. Uh, and it's based, it was inspired by some success stories that we have seen uh, in Karnataka, for example, where people have set up these kind of coding training academies at, in the in the rural areas and are training rural youth in very high end coding, it's not the kind of uh, low end kind of stuff, but and especially for coding that is uh, that helps you become an entrepreneur. So, uh, in particular, we wanted to tie up with Apple uh, to to officially kind of partner this venture. And actually, uh, because Apple is extensively into training as well and certification, and we thought that if, if they agree, uh, then we can come up with our own curriculum, which is in a way approved or endorsed by Apple in combination with their curriculum, which is of course the technical part, but we look at the social, cultural, business angle, and so on as well. Uh, and it, these people would be certified by Apple. Uh, and they would therefore get the opportunity, of course, to be hired or employed by people who would be developing products for the Apple ecosystem. Uh, but also could become entrepreneurs. They could develop their own apps, they could develop their own uh, products uh, and become part of the, the iStore or whatever that whole Apple sort of business platform is all about and, and you know, become, become successful entrepreneurs. So that's one story that, that started quite a few years ago. It went on for some time. We even had meetings with Apple um, in, in California and, and they were quite encouraging. They're already doing similar pilot projects in Brazil and a few other developing countries. So they were quite keen to start this in India, but for some reason it hasn't worked out since then. I mean, so we put the idea on the back burner. Uh, it's not over yet. We're not given up on it, but we still hope to revive it in some other form. Uh, another uh, venture is, uh, is a culture app. So this was again looking at uh, uh, overseas Indians as the, as the market or as the constituency. And the idea was to go beyond uh, religion or Bollywood or whatever, those are the kind of common, uh, you know, access points into culture that they have, but to connect them with their regional culture. So if I am from Gujarat, uh, then can, can I access Gujarati culture and both in terms of the past aspect, but also in the contemporary aspect. So to look at traditional literature, classics, folk music, um, you know, or, or performance arts and so on and so forth. So to, in a sense, to, to look at that, but also to provide a platform for creators or, you know, poets or writers or, uh, you know, theater activists or whoever it may be who are producing stuff today to give them a platform to reach out and connect with their expatriate, uh, you know, members of their community in other parts of the world. So the idea was to create a, both a, like a library or an archive of culture, but also like a living platform of, of new uh, cultural evolution uh, with to tie it up with its audience. So that was another uh, app idea that, that took off pretty well, I think. Uh, and again, it, it for uh, some, certain reasons like logistics and I think the resources needed to actually reach out and market to the audience, uh, it did not succeed too well. But again, that's something that has been put on the, temporarily on the back burner. Uh, the entrepreneur who started this is still very, very, he comes from a culture family. His grandfather was a very well-known writer uh, in Gujarati. So he, he got, and the same idea we thought we'll replicate for all the languages and all the cultures of India once we're able to establish it. So it's, it's a kind of culture, um, you know, a fix or a culture input for anybody. And not, it doesn't even have to be for expatriate Indians. It could be for people in India as well 
who, who would like to connect with their native uh, language and tradition in some sense. The third example that I can think of is a very simple commuting app um, that was created with a view towards, and this was about a decade ago, uh, when Uber and Ola and others were just coming up, I think. So I don't know exactly how far back is that. But uh, the idea was to create a consolidated commuting app which gave you all your op travel options in one place, which at that time was not available, which subsequently Google made available. Uh, so that was a big blow to, the, to this venture idea because somewhere along the way, Google stepped in and actually you know, introduced this feature and that took off the whole appeal of this product. But the idea there, it came from looking at the cases of women being harassed and molested on, in the in the Bangalore, uh, you know, by taking cabs and taxis and so on and so forth. So it, it was in response to that and was, the whole constituency was to create a commuting app for women, uh, which they would, both in terms of the interface and the experience, as well as the sort of features regarding security, safety, and so on and so forth, would be actually built into the app. Uh, and the cool thing with that was the interface design in some sense, which I was, of course, responsible for, where we use the Tinder kind of process, which is the left, left swipe, right swipe, uh, and where the app would give you just one option, which is a kind of optimized option based on its understanding of your needs. So the, the AI would sort of figure out what your need does by asking you a few, few questions like, and give you an optimized solution. It wouldn't give the default uh, idea, the concept design idea was to give all the options, like a spreadsheet, like 40 options of computing going from A to B. So my point was, don't give 40 options, give just one option, the optimized option. And even if it's wrong, the system, the AI should learn from your choices that you make and become better over time. So the 10th time that you use the app, it should be hitting exactly what you need every time. It should be able to predict what you want. And the left swipe would take you to a, a you know, we realized that there were two variables in the computing. So it would give you like a route that take an auto from here to, a, from there to there, take a bus or a metro. And from there to there, you can take another, or to order, you know, so it would give you the whole sort of journey in terms of stages uh, and it would optimize it for the cost and time. So there are two variables, cost and time. So if you swipe in one direction, then things become expensive, but the time comes down. And if, if you swipe in the other direction, then things become cheaper, but the time goes up. So it was like a very simple kind of uh, interface and Tinder was very popular at that time, or just coming into popularity. So we appropriated that kind of uh, the mechanism, the whole operational part from there. So these are some of the ideas that I can share with you. There are many more, of course. Amazing, amazing. I would, I would uh, love to hear more about them. But um, so I think we are uh, uh, out of time. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Arvind. And uh, see you in the next episode. And uh, thank you for sharing all your ideas and thoughts. Thanks, Shankar. Thanks, Steve.